And good morning, everybody. It is show number three. It is an exciting Friday. I don't know where you were sleeping last night, but that east wind that was coming through my bedroom window just made for really, really good sleep. It's not probably so good. Water, uh, air was moving things from field to field. I know farmers don't like that, especially at this time when the wheat is kind of flowering, and that's probably the worst thing that can happen out there. Uh, from field to field, but for me as a sleeper last night, well, I couldn't stop the wind from doing it, so I was enjoying it as it came in. Uh, this is Chat Canna, and an exciting time here in the Midwest in the Red River Valley. My host, which, who is down below me today, we don't know how the boxes are going to come up when we set up for the show. Uh, let's welcome and say hi to Veronica Michael from Prairie Products. How are you? Hello. Hey, everyone. Thanks for coming today and joining us. Uh, I'm so excited to have Harold with us today. Uh, we are going to have an exciting conversation about the hemp fiber industry. And um, so, Harold, yes, why don't you introduce yourself a little bit to our our crowd today? Oh, well, sure. Well, good morning, uh, John and Veronica and all of the listeners out there uh, today. Uh, just happy to be on the show. Uh, my uh, Again, my name is Harold Stanislavski. I'm a uh, project development director. Uh, recently got my title changed to business development director now at the Ag Utilization Research Institute. And uh, what we do, of course, is value-added agriculture, and I'll get into that a little later in the show. Uh, but my background is uh, I'm a native of northern Minnesota up in uh, Roseau County, right next to the Canadian border. Uh, about, uh, about 30 years ago, my wife and I decided to, uh, that we needed to warm up, so we moved all the way down to Fergus Falls, uh, near Fargo. And uh, that's where we, uh, where we live today. I've worked uh, uh, in many different capacities in my lifetime. I, I was uh, an instructor with the University of Minnesota in Extension in farm management and agronomy uh, for 13 years. And uh, then one day, um, Governor Carlson uh, came to uh, Fergus Falls and asked me to join his administration in the Ag Department under then Commissioner Gene Hugeson to be the state business advisor for the livestock industry. And uh, I worked for the Carlson administration. And then uh, later, uh, I, uh, I found out that Jesse Ventura had been elected governor. Uh, it was a shock, as it was uh, to a lot of us. and. Uh, he asked me to stay on as the advisor, and I did. And then I also worked uh, in the Palenti administration as well. So it was a, a, a very good stint at the Department of Ag doing a lot of different things. And then after that, I, uh, I worked as an economic development director in Fergus Falls doing uh, what economic developer director do is try to grow economies. And then uh, I'm back. Ag Utilization Research Institute now where I've worked with them really my entire career on projects, just never as an employee. But I celebrated, uh, I'm going to be celebrating my sixth year with them. So don't add up all those numbers, folks. They add up to a big number. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you so much for joining us today. We're excited to have you. Sure so, are. you know, can you tell us a little bit more, though, about what Ari does um, and the work that they do? Sure. Uh, well, the Ag Utilization Research Institute was created 30 years ago during the farm crisis of the 80s to uh, basically bring attention to uh, the business of commodity farming in Minnesota, that we needed to process more of our things in our state, add value to our things in our state, and capture more of that value and profitability to the farm and then all the value chain. So what AURI does is we only work on value added products in, in four areas really. Uh, one is food. So if you look at food, uh, you see things like nutritional labels, uh, shelf life studies, uh, formulations, uh, new food. Uh, and we'll talk about some of that with hemp, what we're doing with food on the hemp side. So grains, oils, powders, hemp parts would all fit into that food side. And then the other part is bio-based products. Uh, as you know, a lot of folks want greener products, more sustainable products. So we work with uh, fibers from various plants and so forth to create bio-based plastics, uh, bio-based materials, uh, fertilizers sometimes fall into this area. 
and such. And then we work with co-products. These are side streams from manufacturing plants, like say a potato chip plant that would have potato peelings. We would work with that. Uh, we've worked with uh, uh, side streams from uh, malt plants and all of that. And then of course, renewable energy with ethanol and biodiesel. Uh, we have worked with those industries for a very, very long time uh, with uh, the side streams of dried distillers, grains, uh, corn oil, and, and of course the ethanol fuel itself. So those four areas is uh, primarily uh, what we work on. Okay, awesome. Thank you for sharing that with us. So what is happening in the hemp fiber infrastructure in Minnesota, Harold? Well, uh, big question, Veronica. Uh, when you talk about uh, infrastructure, we should define what we're really talking about. Yes, we should. Um, we need to establish what we call a value chain for Minnesota. So in the case of hemp, uh, sure, you can grow the hemp crop, but then can you sell it? And what is required in all those uh, and all that space in between, the equipment to uh, to process, the the employees that are necessary to, to get the job done, the regulatory requirement need to be followed as you go through the process. What kinds of products are coming out and what kinds of technical specifications and quality insurance measurements do we need in order for the end user to accept them? And, and there's really the biggest question of all for us at AURI is what does the end user really want in a hemp fiber product? Uh, particularly if they're, if they're putting it in, uh, in the, automo the automotive industry or if they're putting it into construction materials and all the rest of it. These technical specs and quality assurances need to be you know, figured out and they need to be exact. And they need to be done the same time, the same thing every time in order for the end user to have confidence in what's being done. So this leads then into the agronomy world, which AURI doesn't focus on, but we lean on partners like Extension, University of Minnesota, and all the fine private agronomists out there, because we need varieties, of course, that perform, that have the right characteristics in order to enter them into the supply chain so that they can get processed into the value chain. And uh, so where are we at? Uh, I would say we're at the beginning, uh, so truly at the beginning. Uh, I can tell you that AURI has worked with entrepreneurs who have experimented with hempcrete. And uh, yes, we've made the hempcrete in situ products. We've made the uh, blocks. We've worked with some hempcrete uh, block companies to do this, but we're in our infancy yet to figure out, okay, what is the capex and the operating cost it's going to take to put these facilities up? What is the demand? And, you know, which comes first, the chicken or the egg? Have the customers given us adequate direction as to what they want? Or do we think we have the answer and we're going to say, well, here it is. Uh, those are complicated questions. And I think I'll stop there just so you can ask another, uh, you know, follow up. <laughs> no, those are complicated questions. And I think that really loops back into that, you know, defining that end use market. And we've talked about that, John and I, a lot on our end um, with working on with CBD um, and hemp. But this is a challenge. You know, what kind of work? It's almost like I'm going to start at the end. But what kind of work do you see ahead to start defining those end use markets in the fiber area? Yeah, um, fortunately for us, um, because we are big believers in collaboration, is one should never repeat stuff and do things that already exist if you don't have to. That's kind of a useless waste of time. So we know that our Canadian friends have done a lot of work on him. And our engineer at uh, AURI, uh, Riley Gordon, is, is now part of a technical committee in Canada that he sits on to review, look at all of these specifications that have already been done up in Canada on many value added products. And this is very helpful for us here in the States because we can take a look at those, 
and then we can build our infrastructure and programming around what we think are some of the best parameters available to us in North America. Then we can go to our laboratories. We can start experimenting for people who are entrepreneurs. So if you're an entrepreneur and you come to us and say, I want to make an erosion control blanket for the uh, transportation industry to avoid erosion. How do I do it? And we go, well, just slow down a bit first. That's a big question. But we actually are going to be implementing a project with that with partners such as the Minnesota Department of Transportation that can tell us at least what their specs are. Because they're an end user, right? Mm -hmm. so they're going to tell us what their specs are, which is incredibly important. Then we can go to our infrastructure in the state of matting companies and work with them to do products such as erosion control logs, erosion control blankets, and maybe even spray foam type of materials so that we can use them in the industry. Then the farmer will have a market for the fiber in one uh, value chain. And this is very important, but we got to work with everybody to make sure what we have is what they need. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there's nothing worse than having a product that looks beautiful and it's got all of the background and the sales material and everything like that, but it's just absolutely not needed or wanted or way overpriced or something on the other end. Because exactly. Somebody put a lot of investment out there. Uh, we used to get that in the office products business. People would come to the factory and they would say, I've got a new pen I want to show you. And, you know, but you have to sign in this non-disclosure form. And, you know, they draw the curtains and they'd lock the door. And every time it would be a pen that had a flashlight on the end. I can tell you, it would happen every two or three years that somebody had this genius idea of a pen with a flashlight on the end. And it, it would just, it became a comic thing after a while. But well, John, uh, now they make them with lasers on the end. Absolutely. They've, they've, <laughs> they've improved the, you know, and the guy is saying our patent is coming through because they went to somebody that, you know, charged them $5,000 to walk them through the patent process. And, uh, and you know, just really, you know, an unneeded device. Um, because why do you want to buy a new pen every time or, or a new flashlight mechanism every time you need a new pen? Um, you know, it's just uh, you don't need to do that. And uh, obviously the company I work with never, ever tumbled to it because, first of all, it wasn't an, a new idea. It's been around for, you, you know, there's there's models of that that go back to the 50s. Um, but you, know, you know, John, uh, that brings up an, uh, a thought that I had because people call us and they say, how can they initiate a project with AURI if I have a good idea, say, in the hemp space, the fiber space? Let, let me just explain how that works. Uh, if you're a Minnesota resident and a Minnesota entrepreneur and you're a startup and you call us and say, Harold, I want to make, say, a hemp mat or maybe a hemp creek block or maybe I, I really want to make a hemp wood product, okay? You can contact us. Uh, someone like myself or some of my other business development people will go out and visit with you. And we will, def we will help you scope out your project. And we will kind of review with you, okay, what have you already done? Where are you at in your project? Is this just an idea on a napkin? Or have you thought it out a little deeper? And then if your project kind of is at that point where we think we can help you in our laboratory, the state of Minnesota helps uh, us pay for your uh, invention, if you will, on an 80-20 split. Uh, so we, if we can do it in our labs, we'll cover 80% of the cost and the producer or the inventor will cover 20%. Now that's for anything that we can do in our laboratories, the testing, uh, maybe if we run it through our hemp decorticator, if we clean it, if we spec it, things like this. This is incredibly important because mm -hmm. if an entrepreneur had to do it all by himself, probably couldn't do it because they don't have the equipment for one thing. And then there is science, there is chemistry involved. There is, there is sometimes microbiology involved and we have scientists on our staff who help with that. Now, let's say you're a bigger company and you already have a million dollars worth of sales. 
I think the rate for that is the 33% they have to pay, and then the rest we go. And then if you're a great big company like Cargill, for instance, well, then you got to pay 100%, which is only right, right? Mm -hmm. So we got, that's how you can log into us. We, we do sign non-disclosure forms because the, the entrepreneur needs to be protected. And, and so forth. So we go through that process because confidentiality on projects is incredibly important. So we do that. And then we got to determine how far we can take it before you have to take it to another level. Because there's certain sophistication that we at AURI don't have. People call us and say, Harold, I want to make graphene for uh, fuel cells. You know how, what a big topic that is? Uh, that isn't going to happen at AURI Labs. That's going to happen likely at MIT or someplace like that. Yeah. But it's a good question. It's fundamental. And there are things that we can do to help pave the way. That's wonderful. That's Those are amazing services. Yeah. So, and, you, know, just so you just, go ahead, Eric. Yeah, just, just one thing. I mean, I'll just talk about those services a bit. You know, what we do is applied research, not basic research. And basic mm -hmm. research is, happens at the university and test tubes and inventing that. We do applied research, things that are already known, but they need now to be applied in a system. So that's where we're at. And then we take our science and technical assistance through trained people, help you through that process, get you closer to commercialization of your end product. Then there's the product development side, which people say, gee, do I need a patent? Should I pursue a trademark? Should I do all of this? Obviously, we, we're not lawyers, but we can point you in the direction, uh, is it better to go with a trademark or a patent or maybe a different avenue? Because, you know, it's not always, you know, they're not always clear, okay? Mm -hmm. And then we develop uh, value-added uses for crops and co-products from those saying, hey, your, your invention uh, might fit in the composting market. It could fit in the fertilizer market. Uh, if it's a piece of a food, you may have a beverage solution. Uh, in a week or so, we'll be working with hemp parts up in Crookston. And uh, these are these are all the things that we do because we do feed and fertilizer formulation, uh, assist with the ingredients that are necessary, and then we, ident we can identify uh, toll manufacturers later on once you get your uh, deal uh, further down the road. Wow, those are amazing services. Thank you uh, for sharing that with us. I think uh, there's so many, like you said, costs associated to jumping in as an entrepreneur in the agricultural sector. So it's really amazing to hear that 2080 uh, cost savings. That's, what do you think, John? Well, it's over. that's overwhelming. And of course, yeah. Uh, you know, I think I think some people are hesitant to go because they think that the minute that they they share their idea that it's, you know, out in the world and somebody's going to steal it from them. And it's always the story about the 200 mile per gallon carburetor. Um, Harold, you know that story, right? Uh, I've got one, no. Oh, you've got one. <laughs> <laughs> Everybody knows the story about the 200 mile per gallon carburetor that depending on which car company you're with. General Motors came and, you know, paid the guy a million dollars and they took it and they're not going to let it out on the market because the gas companies, of course, want to sell gas. And I mean, there's always those stories that are around. But yet here we've got literally in our backyard. And for me, literally in my backyard, I mean, Ori is sitting right over there. Um, this company that uh, that wants to partner with you in a positive way and knows a whole bunch of stuff that mm -hmm. an entrepreneur or an inventor or a guy with a good idea uh, might not have or might not have the ideas to say, well, have you considered, are there heavy metals in your product? Or when you say full spectrum, how full of a spectrum is it? Uh, you know, there's these, there's these things that maybe aren't considered that uh, a company can come along and really give you, ask well, the question. You know, you know John, uh, you know, up in Crookston area in the Red River Valley, you know, uh, sometimes we forget because we live there, but we are living in one of the richest uh, natural resource area in the world, the Red River Valley. The soil is just incredible there. And and the people in that area are truly entrepreneurs. AURI has worked with a lot of them up in the, the Red River Valley, everything from from uh, soybeans to to barley, to potatoes, to 
a, a now hemp, just a, a, a great uh, area there to, to innovate in because of the uh, the innovative people who are there. And folks don't realize that goes back like to cream of wheat mm -hmm. and um, uh, the invention that uh, keeps the sugar beet uh, machine on the rose. That was invented by Mr. Keel here on the south side of the river. And you look at it and it's like not a complicated invention, but w I remember how life changed when we got that on our sugar beet farm. And John, don't forget the most important inven invention of all for up in Roseau, the rock picker. The rock picker. <laughs> See, we have, you know, just over here in Fisher, there's 16 feet of topsoil. So rocks are just not not a thing where I, I grew up here and everything. And I think that, uh, that you really missed out. You missed out. We should have had some. Yeah, yeah. yeah. It's like rock pickers for some folks. I mean, that's the difference of a miserable summer or not a miserable summer. So yeah. these things, and there's just uh, Bruce Jovig uh, has just put out his book of about 200 uh, entrepreneurs that go back. I'm not sure if it's 50 or 100 years. Um, and he and he still doesn't have everybody in the book of all of the things that have come from within, oh, 150 miles of Grand Forks and Fargo. Of, of you know, entrepreneurs, like Harold said, that uh, people that saw a need and figured it out and built a few things that didn't work and finally got something that started to work and meet their need. And uh, here we are today. So it's now well, there's an asset right there. When you talk about Sir Bruce, I know Sir Bruce uh, really well, Jovic, and uh, what a what a treasure he is to the area. And, you, and he says, sir, on purpose. Do you know why? Veronica, <laughs> Veronica I mean, sir. No, I, I don't know why. Bruce has been knighted by the King of Norway. No way. It's the, actually that we say, sir, but it's, the, it's a different title in Norway, but it is equivalent being knighted by the queen in England. He is, uh, carries the title of, it's a Norwegian title and it isn't sir, but it's the equivalent of, uh, so he is, yes, Sir Bruce Jovig. Um, wow. That's beautiful. It, it's an incredible honor. That came out about uh, five years ago. Yeah. So, yeah, he is a real asset to, to this community. And, of course, for all of his career, actually, ran the uh, uh, Center for Innovation at UND. He literally got out of college, and uh, uh, he's a chemist. He's a chemist by graduation and did that a short time and came back and pitched them on the fact that entrepreneurship was needed. And I guess it was the right people on the right day, and they gave him a closet to start in and turn it into the entire center for innovation at the university of north dakota so he is amazing. In, in John, John, uh, i, I want to show uh, veronica both of you uh just a little bit on the fiber side i'm holding up here in my in my hand this is uh this is herd that has been processed uh up in thief river falls uh with a company called forsbergs now mm -hmm. this herd uh has been cleaned and so forth uh to uh, already go into a hemp creek mix. Yeah. And uh, th this is an example now of infrastructure uh, that is developing in our state with a great company like Forsbergs, who certainly they've been in the grain cleaning and quality great business for a long time and have gotten to this point uh, getting uh, hemp in, into this area. Now, uh, this is another product. This is the bath uh, off, the, uh, off the hemp plant. Uh, because you, once you get the wood out, uh, then you you have to have the bast, and this is uh, material that can be used in insulation and uh, uh, other products, uh, maybe even erosion control mat, if you will. So these are important products. That here in Minnesota, we have already figured out how to how to separate these two with a great company from um, Montana called Ag Solutions LLC with Andrew Bishop up there, who's working with uh, Fortbricks. Uh, we th we think that these are great ways of uh, of uh, getting some infrastructure going in the, in the state that are less expensive, if you will, to separate the bass from the uh, from the inner core herd wood. Sometimes it's called by using techniques that have been developed here. Uh, decorticators can cost millions of dollars. Uh, hammer mills and cleaning equipment like this are significantly less. And yes, you can't get into every market, but you certainly can get into a variety of markets using that approach. So I just wanted to bring that up because that's in your backyard there in Crookston. 
in Thief River Falls. And uh, it's just another example of some emerging infrastructure that we get excited about at AURI because now we know we've got some good talent there. We'll find some good talent here. And pretty soon you start connecting the dots in the value chain. And then you can develop something like this. Uh, this is hemp wood. This is out of Kentucky, but uh, we have talked to the hemp wood people. And what this is, is a whole hemp plant that's, that's pressed at an enormous PCI, uh, pounds per square inch, to, uh, to make a board that's two and a half times stronger than oak. And this can be put onto, onto flooring. It can be stained. It can be veneered. It can be done uh, lots of things with it to make a value-added product that is, is really good. If, if, if you have cupboard doors in your house and you open them up and you notice that they're kind of sometimes made of uh, particle board, they got a nice veneer on them, but the inside, not too good. Uh, you put a material like this on there and veneer it, and that's going to be around for 100 years. Mm -hmm. How is it, like, could you use it out on decking or is it does it degrade in the sun or is how is it that way? This uh, this particular material is designed to be used inside at the moment. All right. Yep. But what you're talking about down the road with uh, the right coatings, the right thing, uh, certainly probably possible. But right now, the company here, this is all about indoor. Uh, okay, indoor yeah, for sure. For sure. Mm -hmm. So ultimately, too, then it could be uh, the stringers in a house. It could be that. Yeah, that uh, that that is possible too. Um, I think that the company is focusing on this because as we understand the value chain, they can get more money for this because they're competing on the oak space yeah, than they can trying to compete with a pine two by four. Sure, I get yeah. it. Pine is cheaper yet. It's so you have, you have to find the right place for this to start getting into the market early. And then later on when things get more innovative and we find more efficient ways of doing things, then we can get into bigger and and more, uh, you might say, streamlined markets. So it might also work for like the beams in a church when you, the, the old, the, the, the A-frame churches that have those big beams, that might be a place that it would be custom made for it and, and not take those big heavy uh, wooden uh, plant or like uh, the Notre Dame Cathedral, you know, they can't rebuild it the way it was that when it burnt because the forest that those big planks came from is no more. That, that is exactly correct. And uh, while this was made from, from hemp stocks, uh, there might be a question out there from your listener saying, you know, I got all this biomass from my CBD plants. What can I do with those? Uh, well, uh, there is a company called, uh, uh, I think it's called Canna. It's out of Idaho. Uh, they are making a, uh, a, uh, a hemp uh, particle board out of the uh, the biomass from the CBD plant right now. And uh, can it be done? Absolutely. Uh, is it, does it have some really nice characteristics? Yes, I had a sample in my office here. I don't have it right now. But there's another example. While this comes from industrial hemp, um, you know, fiber or food, food and fiber hybrids, the uh, the other one just comes from the CBD plant itself, and that can be used. So that's that's also good news, particularly Veronica, when you were talking about, uh, you know, what might be happening in certain ecosystems uh, in the valley that mm -hmm. want to look at this because what infrastructure do they have? And some some cities have straw board plants that uh, could start innovating in this area. You might say. Yeah, absolutely. Is you know what do you see as the opportunity for hemp farmers who do have some of that waste, so to speak, uh, that they're not utilizing on their land after bucking the material in the fall? Should they be reaching out to partners to try to share that raw material for R and D? What would you What would you think? Well, you know, um, again, I'll show you this. This is this is going to be hard for the, for you to see, but this is a this is a uh, a, a granulated material from CBD plants that's basically turned into uh, a, uh, a, a horticultural fertilizer that can be used. And uh, that's just somebody saying, hey, you know what, how, what can we use this uh, biomass for? They came to us and they say, well, uh, we can granulize it. Uh, we can make uh, pellets 
We can make pellets out of it. And, uh, and then, uh, so, so that could be used, for instance, in uh, wood burning stoves, or the, the, the granular materials can be used to start bedding plants indoors, or even making pucks for aeroponic systems. These are all possible, and we have uh, we have great resources at AURI to characterize those materials, make prototypes of those materials that you can then take to a end user and say, if I could produce a million of these, would you be interested in buying? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. A farmer came to me the other day and said, I've heard that if I put industrial hemp on my land, it's not so good for my soil. Well, why would they, why would they say that? Well, the you know it leaves a pretty it leaves almost trees there. You know, if you come along and take off the the heads for the seeds, you've got a lot of biomass that we're talking about here, and not talking about taking that off at the ground. You're you're putting a lot of that chunk, if we can use use that word, back in the soil. What well, what are we what are we leaving there? Yeah. Okay. Um, in, in Canada right now, when they were harvesting a lot of their food production fields, they were burning the, the stock off. We don't want to do that uh, if we can. That's, that's just not, that's not a good practice, I don't think. So we do need to find those value-added markets to harvest some of that biomass off. It's still going to leave plenty of erosion control um, material left on the soil to prevent wind erosion up there in the Red River Valley because we know how, we know the wind never stops blowing in Crookshire. <laughs> <laughs> but we, but I'm not too worried about it because there is a lot of material left over there, and we have something called really harsh winters here that break down a lot of these materials. And with what I would call minimum tillage, uh, I don't think you're going to run into any problems in light of the fact that they're raising 200 bushel corn up in Crookston right now. And that's what I was going to ask. Compared to corn, is it like more or less? It's the same? I mean, is it, um, you know, 68% of our sugar beets were left in the ground last year. We know what that takes to, you know, a couple of years for that to disseminate into the soil again. Yeah, I, I, I think something that, uh, you know, a lot of people, you know, they everybody wants to do things environmentally and they should. But the hemp plant requires a lot of nitrogen fertilizer, equal to the amount that corn would take. Okay. So let's let's set the record straight right away. If you want to grow a, a good hemp crop, you better fertilize it with nitrogen because that takes a lot of nitrogen. The plant's hungry and it needs it. Uh, but is that bad? No. If the plant takes it and you get uh, the product back in the seed and you get the product back in the fiber that you're going to use, Mission accomplished, right? You just always need to feed the soil, either organically or inorganically, and it's going to be fine. And in the case of the Red River Valley there, uh, those growers, I have all the confidence in the world with the agronomists that they have that they can figure this out to precision farming technique. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Absolutely. So there should be no concern about um, whether whether it's right now most of the stock or or the stock from six inches and down, that should just be there and be gone in a year and we, uh, not, not change the soil structure in any negative way. Yeah, the uh, when when the when the fields were uh, were harvested, the ones that we had up in the valley there, uh, the last few years that were planted, they were grown. Uh, they were the the oil uh, seeds were harvested. They were tilled. And I, I don't have any of the uh, growers who have called me back and said, boy, Harold, we really created a mess here. Uh, I can't raise uh, corn the next year. Uh, it just, uh, they haven't heard a thing about that. that uh, and that's the question. And gets degraded. For a farmer, what, what, what's the best to pre-seed the, the year before? What's the best to follow hemp with? Okay, uh, you're getting into agronomy, but basically... <laughs> Uh, <laughs> basically, the disease side of things, uh, you know, soybeans and hemp can have some of the same disease characteristics. So you wouldn't want to plant, uh, say, soybeans on hemp ground. But you certainly could plant corn on hemp ground. You could plant wheat on hemp ground. You could plant sugar beets on hemp ground. Uh, 
So uh, it's providing the residue is under control. So we just, in, in, in there, you know, it's like edible beans, soybeans, things like this. They have the same uh, disease uh, structure that hemp has. So you want to avoid that. So you, you want, want them ear away from ha any hemp? Right. Okay. All right. Yeah. Well, that's, that's a good thing. There we are. So, so I have a strange question, Harold, but you have a long history in agriculture and working in agriculture. When did you first start getting interested in hemp? Well, uh, it was back in 2014 when, um, when the federal government approved the state of Minnesota for a pilot project hemp program because we really couldn't do anything with hemp if, if we didn't have any legal way to do it. But when the federal government said, listen, under the hemp pilot project, which the state of Minnesota applied for and got, at that point is when we started looking at hemp because now we had a legal way to start looking at the crop, all industrial hemp, not marijuana. So let's just separate that out. Mm -hmm. and. And, and we started working on it. And by the time 2018 came, when the Farm Bill passed, and nobody thought that hemp was gonna be actually approved as a official crop in the United States that fast, but it did. And now, you know, it's got crop insurance. It has, the banking regulations are getting figured out. We have investments kind of being made in, in infrastructure. We have companies like Manitoba Harvest that have set up uh, part of their corporate office in Minneapolis to, uh, you know, to market food grade uh, uh, hemp. Uh, and we've got grass approval uh, generally recognized as safe on, uh, on hemp food products. Uh, you know, we're in. We, we, we've developed a strategy now, a platform of how we can grow this industry over time, legally. Absolutely, absolutely. It's, a, it's been a wild start. I mean, a surprising start in December 2018 to have the Farm Bill pass so quickly and to see what's happened in such a short amount of time. Wouldn't you agree? Uh, absolutely. I, I've looked at the milestones uh, very carefully and there are always entrepreneurs who are kind of impatient by nature and they go, Harold, things aren't happening fast enough. I've not noticed that. I've never noticed that. <laughs> And I, and I go, listen, guys, go back. In, in, in November of uh, uh, 2018, the farm bill was passed. We are now going to be approaching November of 2020. That's, that's not even 24 months yet. And look what's been accomplished. I mean, we are, our lab is full of hemp projects. North Dakota's got a lot of interesting stuff going on. The, 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 the Kentucky comes out with hemp products. Uh, we've got these kinds of things that I showed you. And the fact that uh, uh, Manitoba Harvest is selling uh, hemp uh, food in, in, in uh, the U.S. to the tunes of I don't know how many, how many dollars, but this is all good news. This comes fast. Yep. Do we have some issues with banking yet? Yeah, bankers are, are conservative by nature. You know they they've got to get to it. They want to they want to see the end markets. Who's buying this product? Are they going to offer a contract? Are they going to honor that contract? So our growers don't raise something that they can't sell. And by the way, this is for all the listeners out there. And I firmly believe this. I'm in innovation, but I'm not foolish. You never get into something so deep on something that you can't sell. Take. Take the baby step first, make sure you've got things going. And if it takes an extra year or even two years, you're better off than ruining your entire balance sheet and maybe your marriage uh, because you did something that you just jumped in too fast, okay? That's very good advice. Very good. You're giggling over there, John. Well, it's just, you know, as I talk to people and our, our guest last week, you know, you heard him, you heard him say, you know, it was just, I, and we did, you know, we jumped in and uh, Casey uh, works a full-time day job. And I mean, a big full-time day job. And yet, you know, he'd be here till midnight. And, and of course, you know, I'm going, Casey, I don't know how you do it. Cause I got to go to bed. 
And yet, you know, but there was this drive. There's something about hemp. I think it's got another magic component to it that just because you smell it every day and you have it on your fingers that it draws you to it because there's there, there was something about walking through the field. And I mean, when I got up every morning, the first thing I did was take the ranger and drive the field, you know, and you just kind of drove it with your hand out and it. You know, it brought you back to the, the I don't know. I don't know. It, there was something magic about hemp that I've never had that experience. And I've been in a lot of things. And to come back to the farm and be in hemp, and there's an excitement that I'm sure Harold, well, let's ask him. I mean, Harold, you've been in a lot of things. Don't you feel it? Don't you? There's a buzz. There, There is. Um, you know, um, I think when people do jump into things and they, and, and they take a, what I call a, a careful, calculated approach and work with people, uh, be it ARI, universities, whatever, private sectors, and, and do it carefully and consider, and, and, in, and in with a lot of consideration, uh, they generally get to the end game at the end. And in, in this one here, what I have learned most of anything is, is I'm not worried that we can't produce it or make it or farmers can't grow it. That's not the concern that I have. My concern is, is really trying to get a thorough understanding of what the end user market is and trying to get these specifications and this quality assurance things because John and Veronica, you know what happens in agriculture. Some spec gets developed and you say, well, we got to knock you now because you didn't meet the spec. And it's really painful when that happens or, or we didn't understand exactly what they wanted. And then there's the other side too. There's the due diligence side on the end market because that can be sometimes challenging too. They say, yep, we want it. And we grow it and they say, well, things change. Sorry, uh, you can take your product someplace else. So we have, we have to be careful, especially at AURI because we feel kind of, you know, these farmers and growers, uh, these entrepreneurs, they're our friends. They're our, you know, they're the lifeblood of, in many cases, of our economy. We want to make sure that, that they're in the best position they can be to be successful. And there's still risks. There's still risks. There's no, no such thing as zero risk. But there are some things as good prudence, you might say. Electric cars have been all around since World War I. But now is the time. But mm -hmm. there was a lot of risk taken in electric cars before we got to here. And that's the same, you know, you can look at that on a lot of agricultural products that came along. I, are you old enough, Harold, to remember chinchillas? Chinchillas. Uh, better lighten me up on that one. That, that's not a green bush term. <laughs> well, chinchillas are kind of, I don't know, they're a cross between a rat and a rabbit. But oh, they, sure. There was a time when I was a kid, they were in the back of every comic book, you know, get rich raising chinchillas. If you had a daddy chinchilla and a mommy chinchilla and you put them in your basement, you could just sell it, you know, you'd get rich selling chinchillas. And thousands, millions of people went into the chinchilla business. But there was nobody that wanted to take the animals and the chinchilla fur is very valuable. But there was no supply chain like we talk about with him. Right. So yeah. everybody got into the business, but there was no end unit. There was no end game. But, yeah. you know, as much as we're talking about kind of the the risks out there, I want to talk about where I see some opportunities, too. Yeah. Because uh, here's what I've seen that really makes my toolbox blossom a little bit more. Uh, one is I'm a graduate of North Dakota State University, a very proud graduate, go Bison, and all the rest of it. Uh -oh. and, uh, Cut him off right now. Cut him off. <laughs> <laughs> but North Dakota State University, uh, some of their extension people in agronomy are just some of the finest, folks, and they are figuring things out. You have their ag econ department that, uh, with Dave Ripplinger and people like that, who are really starting to figure out the economics and such of hemp, which is going to be incredibly important. And then, you know, you look at my own state with the University of Minnesota with Dr. George Wieben who's done a lot of the, the kind of the hemp genetics and what the University of Minnesota always does is innovate and try to bring things along. It's great. Your state departments of ag in North Dakota, Minnesota, great. I mean, I tell you, I worked for the Department of Ag for 10 years. 
And I, both states are totally committed to this industry. Uh, yes, they take a cautious approach, but good for them to, 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 to get that started. So I feel good. But in addition to all of that, what we are seeing at AURI, you know, uh, we have had guests in our uh, state from Oregon, from Washington. I've, I've, I've talked to people from Kentucky, Pennsylvania. I know Riley, our engineer, has a network with a host of people all across this country. And we are sharing information. We're sharing information because the best way to grow an industry is to get a base load established that people want. And I know the confidentiality things and all the rest of it. And some of that just, it has to occur. But when you get base load started, it really helps. Why do automobile dealerships want to locate to, next to other automobile dealerships? It provides dynamics, right? And this is the same thing in the hemp industry. And the other thing that I get excited about, my colleagues laugh at me a bit at AURI, is that, you know, hemp alone can do a lot of great things but hemp blended with other materials can also do a lot of great things. So you look at the pet food industry, you look how hemp can be uh, blended in food, use its high omega component with maybe a high protein component of another a food ingredient. So all of a sudden you have something better than they are standing alone. And this happens in our laboratory. I mean, to where we can experiment that. So they come in and say, I want to make a new snack bar. Can I take hemp? Can I take this? And can you characterize the new profile? And how is that going to help somebody who maybe is uh, just want, wants this kind of product for uh, because they're an athlete or something? Uh, these, are, these are so much fun to work on. And it just makes you, it makes you say, you know what? Uh, you know, when I'm done with my career, the person who's going to follow me is going to have plenty of work to do, plenty of work to do, because there's so much to do. And that's the exciting part of hemp. We are working together. Yeah, it sometimes goes a little slower than what we want. But Veronica and John and all the listeners out there, don't don't let me uh, lead you to the fact that, you know, hemp is just totally risky. We can't do anything because it's not true. We are on our way to some really exciting things, particularly in what I'm going to call feed, fuel, coal products, and food. They're all going to be big, and they're all going to be a big, a big play. I agree. Wow. <laughs> You've kind of summed it up, Harold. I think we could do another hour, but I think for today, you know, with that, finish let's kind of wrap it up with you um we want to talk more veronica i mean there's just yeah no, no absolutely harold i so appreciate you taking the time to join us today thank you very much i i feel like i still have like three more questions i wanted to ask so uh, would you be willing to come back harold another time uh of course and uh it's been uh, nice uh visiting with you this morning Wow. And uh, here we are. It's uh, what uh, July twenty fourth today. Uh, we're right mm -hmm. in the, uh, the dog days of summer, and uh, let's enjoy all this summer. And we've had so much heat, so much moisture here that I think uh, I could hear the corn growing last night. <laughs> <laughs> you sure could. It was an incredible uh, wind through the window last night. So again, thank you so much. You can always reach out to us. You've given us several ideas for great guests, and I appreciate that. Look for them uh, to be on our show. And uh, we just want to stay in communication. Uh, Veronica and I put this thing together, and it's going so well. And we just want to reach out and give the greatest of information to our listeners and really make this hemp industry something that Americans can be proud of. And I think we're on that track. I think well, we are, too. Very good, uh, Veronica. We'll see you. And John, so good to see you. Uh, keep that valley uh, in good shape up there. <laughs> I'll be up to touch the next week. We'll look forward to seeing you. Thanks. All right. Bye. Bye, Harold. Wow. Another nice. great show, huh? That was amazing. You know, I, uh, so my, one of my first jobs was uh, hoeing sugar beets. So I am from Climax, Minnesota, as you know. So hoeing sugar beets was the way I was able to make some funds to go to the NDSU basketball and volleyball camps that I wanted to go to and get those uh, new Nikes that I wanted. 
But it also is actually what excites me. I think back to that time and watching the sugar beet industry grow. And, yeah. you know, I think for anyone that's watching hemp right now, you can really make some parallels to everything from, you know, machining and new technology in uh, really agricultural machines to seed technology to planting post-harvest uh, products. But uh, this is as an exciting time as we saw back in the 80s with beets, I think. What do you think, John? Oh, I do. I, that's why I keep saying, you know, uh, uh, my grandfather is one of the people that brought a handful of beet seeds over from Germany. And, and you know, uh, my, my dad and his brothers were the start of the sunflower business in the Red River Valley in 59 and 60. And here we are, you know, we're going to be able to tell uh, the generations after us that we were there when hemp started. And, you know, not to degrade from anything of the other things, but, you know, sunflowers are sunflowers. That's all. It, that's what they do. Sugar beets make sugar, kind of nothing else. A little bit of cattle feed in the pulp. But the hemp product has, you know, medical, wood, concrete, uh, just taste. Fiber. Fiber. Fabric. I mean, there's just no end, and we we're only we're only starting to do it, and then now we're hearing about Ori will will take that and put the scientific twist on it that an entrepreneur can't do in his garage. Uh, and for that, like investment, that's unbelievable. I mean, for any Minnesota resident looking to dabble with any even byproduct they have on the farm if they're a current grower, that is an unbelievable buy-in, twenty percent. And then, and then to do the financial thing. That's right. Mm -hmm. That's right. And I, I didn't ask him, but I don't think there's any back end payback or anything. It's, I don't think it's like no. if you succeed that, you know, somehow you owe it back. I mean, I think they're just investing. No, they're in, investing uh, in the people of Minnesota. Minnesota entrepreneurs. So North yep. Dakota guys, if you need a partner, I'm in Minnesota. <laughs> so uh, we'll put it together, but w yeah. what a great thing and what a great show. Now you need to take you a little know. time and tell us about next week. You've got somebody hooked up for next week. Yes. So next week we have David Ripplinger from NDSU's Extension joining us. David oh, is the kind of man behind the scenes at the Nor Northern Hemp Conference that took place last year in Bismarck and also the Northern Hemp Roundtable that you and I both attended mm -hmm. just a couple months ago. Um, but David is really doing what Harold actually kind of gave a nod to David, is doing great work in Extension, really looking at the economics of the hemp industry, how are folks really finding out good information about um, commodity pricing in hemp. He's really doing a variety of things, but then also I think really kind of tying together and bringing together some information that a lot of great researchers are doing in the field in North Dakota. So he'll be sharing some information with us next week, and I'm really looking forward to that. I am too. Um, I think we're on to something here with our little show. Uh, we hope that uh, people will start giving us feedback. Um, it's a lot of fun to do with you, particularly. I think that, you know, at least for me, I, I've hit the right partner here because you, you're you're just fun to do a show with. And I can tell you over the 40 years that I've been in broadcasting, that's not always been the case. And so, so no. uh, this is just fun and I'm learning so much. Uh, you know, he answered questions I didn't even ask, but then, uh, you know, he just, he just, I filled up my page with no. I I know me too. You know, one thing that I was really, I, I really appreciated about Harold is his boldness in talking about the end use markets. And I, you know, you and I talk about this in our free time, but that struggle to really find those commodity markets, right? I mean, you're shaking your head. I think you want to say yes. something. Too. No, no, no. I'm going, yes, yes. Yeah. Exactly what you're so it's so wonderful to hear him speaking about that and providing that research and development support because you and I are both out there in the trenches as entrepreneurs with a lot of investment and investors for both of us in our uh, projects that we're not, you know, we are those impatient entrepreneurs not moving as fast as we'd yeah. like. Um, <laughs> uh, but yeah, so it was good to be reminded that, hey, this has been a huge leap in two years and since the farm bill passed to be where we are all standing right now. I, I think it's wonderful. And that's funny. Like you said, you know, about moving forward and, and, and that's the thing, you know, and some night, days I go, Casey, what do you mean you have to go to your regular job? You know, <laughs> what do you mean you have to go to work? Uh, so it's like, yeah, because it's, you just want to move it forward and, 
and there's so many exciting things and there's not enough hours in the day and you wish you could find, you know, other like-minded people, but, but, uh, you know, either they're employees and you have to pay them because I am a, you know, I believe in paying for free for services. I mean, and, uh, or, 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 you know, you have to get more partners and everybody is on their own track and I respect that and appreciate it. So, ah, oh, another day, Friday, another day, it's the weekend hey. part of the great part of the show. It's always on a Friday. And so, so lots of things to do. You have a wonderful, I got to point that way a little bit. Yep. You have a wonderful weekend. We're looking forward to next <laughs> Friday show. Um, I showed you this, and for our, our guests, this is a product that we've developed. Um, it's full spectrum. Oh, and see, uh, I have that background. And now Casey's going to uh, let me uh, let me kill my background so that you can uh, see what I have here. Um, bum, bum, too many too many buttons to push. There we go. Um, because it's green, you see, I got to switch to a blue screen. Hmm. Oh, it's beautiful. Think of a deodorant bar, but this is mm -hmm. actually full spectrum hemp uh, with some beeswax and some other emollients and really nice things, all completely natural. And uh, instead of having to get lotion that you end up with it all over your hands, it stays in your hand and uh, you can apply it where you need to and uh, you can put it on your lips. Um, this particular fragrance probably isn't a lip fragrance. This happens to be uh a sandalwood cedar. Ooh, I can't wait to get my hands on it, John. I will get so, some. I will get some to you. So uh, no, please get some to me. So hey, listeners, actually, uh, and on the Prairie Product side, we are doing some site improvements on our retail website. Awesome. So we that means that we're in that place now where the the site is live, but all of the networks around the world are trying to find it. So it looks like it's still down for a bit, but. We have some new products too that you're going to see on there. We have some pet chewable tablets, uh, a new uh, focus and energy tincture. Um, but I would love for everyone to check it out at www.prairieproductsnd.com when we are back up and running. Good. And when that happens, we'll get links up on our on the Facebook slash chat canna. You know, we'll get every, we're going to get everybody connected here so you can see all the stuff that we offer. And we're going to, you know, um, our friend last week, uh, Uncle, uh, Uncle Funkies, Uncle Funkies, Riley. Got some stuff to sell. We're going to get everybody connected because we're not as much in competition with each other as we are to get our products out to to everybody and, and let them make good choices. So, oh, absolutely. And to see the variety of products. Right. Because just like um, our guest Harold was talking about, there's a lot of applications here. And everyone has to find that way that works for them. And yeah, this is about lifting up all boats. Everybody lifting up the boats. It's awesome. Uh, you have a good week. This is Chat Canna. Every Friday, 9 o'clock is a new show. Neater than radio and television. You can watch us anytime. You can go back and see the old shows. Some really great information. My wonderful, wonderful co-host, Veronica Michael. My name is John Reitmeyer. And... We'll see you all next week. We'll see you next week. All righty. Bye, Bye, everyone. Thank you.